as we've been going through the different management issues, whether it's pain, spasticity, and the like, um, everyone in the room has a, who's been affected by one of these conditions has a different pattern of symptoms they suffer from. And for a lot of our community, when inflammation occurs in certain parts of the nervous system, breathing can be affected. And this is something we saw um, with really painful details during the outbreaks of acute flaccid myelitis uh, going on in 2014 and 2016 and 18. And what we're watching for right now and seeing a little peak of it occurring as we speak around the nation. Um, at the forefront of work in AFM was Dr. Keith Van Heron, uh, who's joining us from Stanford University, who in collaboration with Carol Glazer, even before the 2014 outbreak, uh, was seeing and identifying patients for what we would now classify as acute flaccid myelitis, and we're thrilled that Keith could join us today to um, talk about the respiratory complications of acute flaccid myelitis and what his experience has been. So, Keith, it's all yours. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, inviting. Uh, delighted to be here. I'm a child neurologist and uh, uh, pediatric neuroimmunologist at Stanford, and uh, I'll be talking about respiratory complications. I, I don't have any real financial disclosures to make. My biggest disclosure is that I'm not a respiratory specialist. Um, so I'm speaking from the perspective of a neurologist looking through the lens of uh, neurologic disease on respiratory complications, and I'm going to be discussing um, some things that we'll, um, uh, we just have a little bit of introductory data for, so I'll, I'll caveat that as we get to it. Um, so the, to provide a little bit of background on AFM, since we haven't covered it uh, too much quite yet, uh, this is the, the general uh, experience for individuals who um, experience AFM is they typically have a, a respiratory or infectious prodrome followed by a period of recovery and then followed then after, thereafter by a period of neurologic um, weakness. The weakness is, is unique in that it's flaccid weakness. Most of the um, syndromes that we see in uh, neurology that have involved injury or um, to the central nervous system cause spasticity, as uh, uh, mentioned in the two prior talks. This causes flaccidity, which means just kind of floppiness, and that's what characterizes this syndrome in part. <clears throat> so uh, along with this weakness to the arms and legs and sometimes the face can also uh, include respiratory weakness, so uh, weakness of the breathing muscles, specifically of the diaphragm. And this can get really dangerous. It's uh, one of the reasons we treat acute flaccid myelitis as a neurologic emergency, as opposed to some of the other syndromes we see where we consider it urgent, but we don't have to uh, move patients right to the ICU for monitoring. Here, this, this gets dangerous in a, in a meaningful number of patients. So um, that period for most patients passes, and they recover from the rest, acute respiratory ailment. But in the, and that's what the part of, I would say we all know best as, as, a, as, a, as a neurology community, and an intensive care community, um, but as I'll allude to at the end here, we don't know the, the kind of long-term area quite as well, or we haven't described it quite as well, and I think there's probably more for us to learn. So um, in patients with acute flaccid myelitis, there's a, there's a characteristic injury of the central gray matter of the spinal cord, and this is uh, specifically uh, the affecting the neurons in the uh, spine that, um, that control the, the muscles, is right, right at the level of the muscles. And this, um, in, uh, in, this is just a slide from the California cohort of patients between 2012 and 2015, but what I'm pointing out here is this, this kind of inverted bar graph here shows that um, where most of the lesions in our patient group were occurring, and I'm, I've highlighted those, uh, um, those the C345 mean, those at cervical level three, uh, three, four, five. Those are the nerve roots coming out of those areas of the spinal cord. Those um, innervate uh, the phrenic nerve, and the phrenic nerve is what drives the diaphragm. So if you injure those nerves, uh, you know, famously, you can impair breathing. And this is a very common and dangerous complication. Um, 
for some individuals, it's very severe injury to this, these nerves. For others, it's, it's mild and can recover. Um, but this is, again, um, what makes acute flaccid myelitis uh, a neurologic emergency. So respiratory support during hospitalization. This is what we know the most about. And from several cohorts, uh, we have uh, you know, data say, well, it's common. So we have uh, the California cohort, where about 30% um, were intubated, requiring mechanical ventilation. And then the national US cohort in 2014, similar numbers. In 2015 to 2017, you know, we have like uh, about 30 percent. Again, in the 2018 national cohort, we had about a, you know, uh, about a quarter of patients. So it's, we're talking about a large group of patients here who are experiencing this, and um, and uh, so um, uh, uh, Carlos, who is uh, around here at the meeting uh, this week, is did a wonderful job of putting together and uh, with with. Uh, uh, team Owen Murphy and a um, uh, group of others putting together some guidelines um, for acute flaccid myelitis, and they included um, care on res care of respiratory complications. And so, in the acute setting, the most important thing to know right up front is you need to stabilize patients for you know triage um, and stabilize patients for the possibility of respiratory failure. And there are some pretty detailed um, guidelines here on acute management. Um, and those include just um, monitoring for respiratory function on a frequent basis, um, maintaining um, you know, specific thresholds for intubation and ventilation. I'll say that typically we expect patients to move through this and, and uh, if they need respiratory support, it is more often temporary and many recover afterward. Um, but for a subset of patients, it is, it is not. It, is, um, it, it requires longer-term respiratory support. And I would say that the post-hospitalization period is the part we, we really need more information on. We don't have great follow-up guidelines quite yet. And uh, I had, uh, so I, I will, <laughs> I, there was a, a case that brought this to the forefront for me. Um, it was, uh, it was uh, as is uh, often the case, it's a, it's a patient and a family who, who tell us what, what really needs to be done. And this was a young man who had had a, a, a reasonably typical course, except perhaps for how well he recovered. He had almost complete um, flaccid paralysis of all four extremities with respiratory failure, and he recovered unusually well over a, a two-month period. He was needing, at the time we sent him to uh, a rehab, he was needing BiPAP um, only at night. And then I, I, I think at the time, sometime during rehab apparently, he was taken off the nighttime BiPAP and sent home. And then um, time passed. Uh, he was followed up um, in various clinics and then, and then one day came to see me and dad was, I think, reasonably upset and the, the uh, young man had gone away to college and had uh, had a heavy night of drinking, and his roommates had found him breathing very irregularly and taken him to the emergency room, where he was. Um, I should specify, he was incredibly an incredible athlete, had recovered very well in almost every respect, and so was just functionally um, uh, like, you know, doing great and um, physically and, and intellectually in college. So. They were somewhat surprised to find out that he had really severe sleep apnea. Um, so he was evaluated at, at his local university uh, medical center, and they uh, diagnosed really severe sleep apnea. Um, he was put on a BiPAP machine and, and was doing very well um, uh, thereafter, had much less fatigue and drowsiness thereafter. Um, and, you know, and the father came in and he said, listen, I, you know, why wasn't this caught? How was my son sent home with this? this is, has this been going on for longer? And I said, yeah, you know, it probably has. And uh, this was the first uh, patient I'd seen like this. And um, I asked around if any other colleagues had seen this. And we, we didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was recurring commonly. But um, there was another patient I saw thereafter. And I said, okay, there, uh, there's not quite as severe as this one. But I said, there's something to this. We should look a little further. So I had a wonderful um, uh, medical student at the time. She's now, this is uh, um, Rosina Zizbo. She's now at MGH, by the way, um, Michael and Anastasia. She's in child neurology there. She's terrific. I would highly recommend uh, uh, trying to recruit her into your clinics. Um, but she and I uh, put together a nice um, 
uh, case series uh, with some of our team, and uh, we described our goal was to describe the post, you know, the the acute and post hospitalization course of acute flaccid myelitis, and um, we did. We had a you know reasonably a fairly small cohort of only uh, about 20 patients, um, but half of them had respiratory. Uh, complications as defined by needing supplementary oxygen, intubation, or similar features. And then the part I want to uh, draw your attention to in this um, long table is uh, the post-hospitalization care. And um, specifically, I, I want to point out that um, uh, several of the patients did get sleep studies um, after their acute care, and, and uh, a meaningful number of them had um, uh, central and obstructive sleep apnea, so what we're calling here um, central hypoventilation. So um, one of our patients was this one who was a sentinel case and then a follow-up that I'd seen, and one I, I didn't even re quite recognize at the time. Um, but I also want to point out that um, several patients who were not in the um, respiratory complication group had post-hospitalization, you know, respiratory complications, mostly asthma attacks, and there's a high you know, a coincidence of asthma in this, in the um, children with AFM already. That's just, it seems to be one of the risk factors for developing acute flaccid myelitis. Um, I think the larger point here was there, there's more probably re of a respiratory story to uh, good quality care for these kids, or mostly kids. And um, I think this is a good place for us to circle back and take a closer look at. Um, so uh, I think we're probably not giving enough, offering enough referrals for these, uh, for these children or screening them as, as well as we could. And um, I think this is a good place for us to, uh, to, to think further. So um, these are the three kids that I saw with the central hypoventilation syndrome. I'm pointing this one out specifically because it's, it's one that I wasn't really tuned into. I'm not a sleep specialist. I'm not a respiratory specialist. And, um, but these three kids had meaningful complications. Um, none of them, I should say, were, you know, had long-term intubation. One of them did have, a, does still have a tracheostomy. Um, and uh, two of them, two of the three, still require um, ongoing um, support. And um, uh, yeah, I, um, I will, uh, to just a few words on sleep apnea. So how is it diagnosed? Well, um, you need a sleep study to diagnose it, and the sleep study involves you going into a hospital, you know, outpatient unit, and you get all kinds of electrodes taped to you, and they measure your breathing and your electrical activity and um, how much oxygen and carbon dioxide are going in and out, and and they um, they diagnose sleep apnea if your um, blood oxygen levels fall below a certain threshold for a certain amount of time and your carbon dioxide levels rise too far, and there are really two major kinds of sleep apnea. One is called central sleep apnea, when the problem originates from the brain or the nervous system somewhere. The other is the, most, the much more common form, which is called obstructive sleep apnea, which is the kind that most of us would be familiar with, where we're snoring at night and not breathing regularly. And um, they're both treatable. Um, uh, let's see, I think I've got one. Yeah, so they're both treatable. Um, one is uh, treatable with uh, CPAP, typically. That's the obstructive sleep apnea. But the central sleep apnea that we're thinking about here is treatable with a, it's a very similar machine. It just has a few other settings called BiPAP. Um, I'll just add here that uh, for those wondering what is central sleep apnea and why is it happening to the patients, uh, to these patients with AFM, and I, I would say it's probably um, uh, just a general complication of neuromuscular weakness. There may be more to the anatomical association here. I, I thought there might be. We didn't find one in our study. But um, it was, it is common among um, neuromuscular disorders, and it was reported as, a, as an uncommon complication of poliomyelitis in the historic literature. And uh, I, I suspect we're probably missing, a, you know, some number of, of kids who might have this who've had AFM, um, but I don't expect it to be common, I think, but I think it's one of these things that's important and can impact children's lives because it can affect their nighttime oxygenation and their sleep level and their fatigue, and it can potentially be dangerous. So I do think we should uh, look for it. Um, I would say to, to uh, kind of circle back on kind of larger story here, 
So outpatient management of respiratory recommendation complications in AFM. We don't really have guidelines for this yet. I would say we can we can say they're still in development. Um, we uh, we do I think need to consider more pulmonary pulmonology outpatient evaluation. So that's a respiratory specialist. I would say we should consider this probably in most, maybe all patients with a high cervical cord lesion and certainly any who've been intubated. And then for those who, um, who may have experienced or you know, maybe wondering about sleep disordered breathing or funny sleep sounds or just curious in general, I think it's worth talking to your, to your um, local uh, neurologist and, and pulmonologist about this. Um, I, uh, to, to truly diagnose it, you need a sleep study, but that, that may be appropriate. Okay, so to summarize, um, compl respiratory complications are common in AFM. Uh, they typically occur with uh, lesions in the high cervical cord. Uh, it's what makes it a neurologic emergency and why we take such care to triage it. Uh, during outpatient hospitalizations, I, I think we should consider pulmonary follow-ups for, for you know, more, more patients than not. And uh, I think... Um, Abnormal breathing during sleep can persist even when other respiratory symptoms have resolved. So you can have, we can have uh, uh, young people who look very healthy in every other respect, and they may have sleep disordered breathing that's going on un unrecognized, as was the case with uh, one of our patients. And um, I think uh, asking about this uh, is maybe something we, we can consider doing more of and considering when a sleep uh, referral is necessary. So uh, even among our patients without respiratory complications in the inpatient setting, we, we may have more in the outpatient setting. So another good reason for a pulmonology referral. And uh, that's it. I want to thank the um, uh, Siegel Berner Immune Association. For, it's a great, been a great meeting. I've really enjoyed it. So um, thanks for hosting. Thanks for inviting. It's been really a delight to hear people's stories and, uh, and um, hear the discussion. So I'll be happy to take questions here. Uh, this is kind of a, um, a, an obscure topic, but I'll, I'll, yeah, thank you. Go ahead. So, uh, was one of the major, or let me rephrase this, fatigue is, a, is something that I see with my child that has AFM. And she spoke yesterday, and she seems to be doing really well. Um, is this something that you think we should look at, or, and obviously, uh, yeah, Dr. well, Greenberg. yeah, um, I mean, I, I, I want, I'll start by prefacing that fatigue um, <laughs> is one of the complications um, that we, as a medical community, have the hardest time assessing and treating, and it can have many different causes, and I. Um, it is one of the things that I find, I'll say to patients, I consider it foundational. If you're tired, you can't do anything else. You know, or if you're in pain, you can't, you know, you can't do anything. It's, it's one of these really foundational things. If you have it, it just, it disrupts every other part of life. Fatigue is really important. Um, assessing it is, is tough. I, I do think as a neurologist, I, especially in kids, in adults, we, we think about obstructive sleep apnea much more frequently. In kids, we don't um, because it's not, because typically uh, um, obstructive sleep apnea comes from, you know, other kinds of adult complications in kids they are less common. So could it be relevant to your daughter's case? It certainly could be. Um, I think the questions to ask your, you know, your, your daughter, is she more tired in the morning? Does she wake up feeling tired? Um, and uh, I think discussing that with a neurologist is a possibility is certainly a good one. If you're if, um, I, I don't recall offhand, I'm sorry, if she was um, uh, intubated um, as, a, uh, um, as a patient. And if so it, it might put her at slightly higher risk, yeah, for uh, high risk for a sleep, you know, a sleep disturbance as well. So it could be. Um, and uh, to really figure that out, you need a sleep study to, to, to solve that. Is there any particular sleep study that's different than another? I've been through one, and they yeah. sent me home with this little thing, and I put it on, and yeah, I, I got a CPAP out of the deal. But, you know, are these children, or is this a, a in-hospital setting? Do you prefer that as opposed to the little take-home kit? Or 
Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, um, I think they're pretty standardized. They may have the ability to do them in different settings, a home setting or a kind of a hospital setting. And typically the children's hospitals have their own special setup because kids aren't used to sleeping all by themselves in a room and they might need a little bit of you know, parent company. But um, they would, uh, if you went to, uh, got a referral to a pediatric sleep specialist, um, you know, or for teenagers, uh, you know, an adult sleep specialist may, may suffice too. But uh, that would, that would, they would set the person up for the right, the right device. As far as I, I know, there's, all, the sleep studies that are done are all very similar. What's dif what differs may be the interpretation. A question that came in online, uh, Dr. Van Haren. Are there any cases where the patient did not have respiratory symptoms at the time of hospitalization, but some respiratory complications came up years down the line? Yeah, the, but I'll caveat that by saying they were more asthma related and occasional like pneumonia related. So whether they were truly, they may not have been related to the acute flaccid myelitis event directly. But just to, just to identify or, or flag individuals with acute flaccid myelitis, just being at risk in general for respiratory complications and needing to connect with a pulmonologist as being a good, probably standard of care as, as I put out there. We didn't have any patients in our very small cohort who had um, you know, sleep disordered breathing that was not present probably during the initial hospitalization. All of them, I think, had sleep disorder breathing during their hospitalization. Some of it was, was triaged better than others, but. But uh, yeah, a good thought for fatigue. If fatigue is present, I, I think worth considering. Well, thanks very much. All right, thank you, Keith, and thanks everyone for the great discussions this morning. So let me just, um, before everyone runs out to lunch, let me just tell you how things are, are gonna work from here. So lunch is across the hall in the Los Angeles room, and if you look at your schedules after lunch, um, are, are uh, breakout sessions. So if you look at the schedules, there are three tracks. Each track has two different talks. You can go from one track to the other. So if you want to do the first talk in track one and the second talk in track two, you can move uh, throughout. Track one, which includes transitioning from hospital to home and then later early rehabilitation strategies is going to be here in this room. The track focused on pediatrics, starting with pediatric mental health and then going to transitioning from childhood to adolescence to adulthood is happening in century A. And the track on building a healthcare team followed by therapy for retaining function is happening in century B. So what's listed as track one is here, what's listed as track two is century B, and track three is century A. Those are all gonna start promptly at 1.30 because there are online portions to this. So you have a solid hour plus nine minutes, thank you guys, um, to have lunch, connect, walk around, stretch, uh, but we're gonna ask all the tracks to start right at 1.30. All right, enjoy lunch, everybody.